So, Matt, um, you at the uh, you folks at the People's Policy Project have come out with a pretty substantial um, a policy paper on something called a social wealth fund uh, that you are proposing America um, adopts. Let's first talk about the the problem that a social wealth fund is uh, you're proposing to solve. What 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 is the 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 problem that a social wealth fund will address? The main problem is wealth inequality. So in the United States, millionaires own about 80 percent of the country's wealth, while the bottom third collectively owns nothing. And it's been getting that level of inequality has been getting worse and worse year after year. So, for example, in the last 10 years or so, the top one percent has increased their wealth on average by four point nine million dollars, while the median family has seen their wealth decline by forty two thousand dollars. And so what we're trying to do is find some way to smooth out the distribution of wealth across the country uh, in a gradual way that is economically responsible. And that, that's what the social wealth fund is, is hoping to do. And we should be clear here when we're talking about wealth disparity, this is different from income disparity. This is um, the wealth that one has at any given time. That is distinct from anything that might be coming in on an annual basis. And, and you know, uh, one of the things I think people don't understand, too, is that the biggest one of the biggest drivers of, of wealth in this country is has been uh, home ownership over the years. And um, that, of course, takes a certain amount of money uh, to establish in the first place. So this is this is a function, largely speaking, of we have all sorts of different. Uh, policies in this country that makes it easier for money, essentially, to accumulate more money. Yeah, and and I would say it's not even just specific policies. Um, I mean, we certainly have those, for instance, uh, income received from stocks and bonds and rents are taxed generally at a lower rate than income received from working. And so if you have wealth, which generates interest and dividends, then you are able to kind of allow that wealth to accumulate because it doesn't get taxed as much. Uh, but also more generally, it's just the case that the nature of capitalism, if we can put it that way, is that uh, people start out with small differences in income and wealth, and those differences compound over time. Because like you said, We're not talking about income, which is how much you get paid uh, every year. We're talking about the accumulation of generations of income uh, over time. And and so that that typically tends to concentrate wealth uh, in the in the hands of of a small number of people. You wrote in the um, uh, the report that the percent of wealth owned by the top 10 percent of of each demographic group. I mean, just uh, before we move on to to the solution here, just, you know, tease that out for us. What does that mean? Yeah. So what I was trying to do there is some people, when they see that wealth is distributed very unevenly, their natural thought, their first thought is, well, let's think about this. You know, white families on average have a lot more wealth than black families and Latino families. Uh, Families where the head has a college degree has a lot more wealth than families whose head uh, has less than a high school degree. And so there's a tendency to start to think, well, maybe the reason wealth inequality is so high is just because we have a lot of differences between some groups have a lot and other groups don't. And so what I try to show is, while it is absolutely true that some groups have way more wealth than others, It is also true that if you go into any given group, if you just look at black families, the top 10 percent of black families own 70 percent of black wealth. If you just look at uh, people who only have a high school degree, the top 10 percent of families who only have a high school degree own 70, 75 percent of that group's wealth. And so it's it's not a issue of some groups have more than others. It pops up over and over again in, in every demographic group. 
Uh, so in some respects, it's both things are operating. We have um, uh, some racial disparities. We have some um, uh, demographic disparities. But there is some fundamental dynamic that exists within the context of capitalism that promotes this type of disparity. And so this social wealth fund is uh, almost letting a little bit of air out of the tire, as it were. Um, so, all right. So so go into um, I mean. Give us uh, the broad definition before we go into some of the details and and the historical examples of a social wealth fund. What what does that mean? A social wealth fund? Yeah. So on the on the most general level, a social wealth fund is a collectively held financial fund that is fully owned by the public and used for the benefit of society as a whole. Um, When you get into particulars, what we're basically talking about is, you know how universities have endowments where they have these big piles of money and they invest them and those investments create return that they then spend on the university? Well, take that idea but put it for the whole country and we'll have an endowment for the whole country that we all benefit from. That endowment, when it gets investment returns, those investment returns can either be paid out to everyone in society as a universal dividend. It could be used for social welfare purposes. Uh, it could be used for a variety of things. But, but that's the basic idea. So let's get one of these big funds going, like they have at universities or like mutual funds have or like hedge funds have. Let's get one of those going, but for everyone in the country instead of for a small group of institutions and affluent investors. So the idea is just that the United States as as a country will invest um, in the way that uh, other large institutions do. Uh, it's just that it's for the benefit of all citizens. How is this? I mean, how, how analogous is this to the Social Security Trust Fund? We we pay taxes into uh, Social Security. Um, that money uh, sits in a fund that was um, that is uh, ostensibly collecting interest and is there to try and smooth out uh, demographic uh, bumps. Right. We had the baby boom and then um, things dropped off a little bit and the millennials are big. And so this is uh, that trust fund is supposed to smooth that out. How similar uh, or different is it from that idea? In broad strokes, it's similar. The Social Security Trust Fund is a unique thing because all of the money in it is invested in treasury bonds. So it's the government is buying its own debt as an investment. So there are some weird um, components to it. But if you could imagine a situation where you had Social Security funds and instead of them being invested in treasury debt, they were invested in real estate, invested in stocks or bonds or other kinds of things like that, that would be very similar. And there are countries that do that. For instance, in Finland, their social security funds for old age and disability pension are invested in these kinds of in these kinds of assets. All right. Well, look, we're going to take a break here. And and when we come back, uh, I want you to go through the history of these funds, how it would be implemented in this country. And, uh, you know, who would who would be the the beneficiaries of this fund? I mean, presumably uh, the American citizens. I'm also curious as to how much Wall Street skims off this. That's uh, you know, that makes me a little bit nervous. Let's talk about that when we return. I'm Sam Cedar. This is Ring of Fire Radio talking to Matt Brunig about uh, his proposal or I should say the People's Policies Project proposal for a social wealth fund for America. We'll be right back.